from the Department of Mecha Mechatronics Engineering. He is a senior robotics research heading the mechanical division of the research subsystem at Mars Rover Manipal, where he has worked on designing, modeling, and implementing a fully in-house seven degree of freedom redundant robot, a robotic arm. He is currently researching the field of bio-inspired engineering, uh, especially biomimetics and biomechanics, and is working towards creating a modular exoskeleton-inspired mobility enhancer. His technical expertise lies in mathematical modeling, analysis, and simulations of mechanisms, mathematically constrained me mechanical design, and industrial me mechatronics, to name a few. This is going to be a session on the various divisions in the field of robotics and the important role that mathematics plays in it, along with an overview on the possible research uh, on the possible areas of research. Um, so, Nihal, you can take over from here. Okay, Ankita, thank you. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, I should probably say an obligatory good morning to whoever slept through the afternoon session today. I mean, I did. Uh, <laughs> It's raining buckets outside my house, so don't mind me if my uh, audio cuts out. So, to before I begin, let me just tell you that although this session is talking about a uh, mathematical perspective, I won't delve much into equations as such because I know that whenever anyone talks about mathematics, their eyes just glaze over, like they, they just won't be anywhere but here. So, I won't bother you guys with that. But I will explain the concepts behind each uh, mathematical uh, formula theorem that we apply in robotics. Now, before I get to the meat of the session, I want to clear something up. When we talk about robotics as a field, now, uh, bef let's say before the 12th standard, right? When we talk about robotics in the general media or even the various robotics tutorials and everything that you see, up on YouTube and those various workshops that we have, all of them are very, to be very blunt, they are very kiddie. I mean, you do some stuff on an Arduino, uh, run some motors, and that's it. You're, you're a robotics engineer. I mean, that's what the workshops say. Now, I want to tell you that this is not robotics. I mean, in a way, it is, but yeah, well, yes, but actually, no. This is what robotics is. I mean, there's a lot of work, a lot of mathematical modeling, making of graphs, uh, simulations that actually goes into the making of an actual robot, not the kiddie Arduino stuff that you see everyone doing workshops on, on YouTube or they say even an MIT. Now, of course, don't be uh, scared. I mean, it looks very intimidating, but I guarantee it's not. Once you uh, get started on this journey, it'll, it's going to be very simple. I mean, look, all these diagrams and equations, they look very intimidating. It looked the same to me at first when I first started out. But trust me, it's not going to be that way. Now, the concepts that you learn here, in, in, what I'm talking about in this session and even uh, later on when you start learning, they don't apply just to robotics. So to give an example, let's say you're a, math, you're a mechanical engineer, right? And you are designing say a cnc you must have heard of a cnc cnc mill or a cnc uh, drill now say every cnc has a code right or uh, it's called a g code and it tells the cnc uh, how far it has to go how they uh, how deep it has to drill so let's say it has starts from here so it go maybe five centimeters here five centimeters here uh, one mm down now how do you tell the cnc or rather how does the cnc know that these numbers that you're telling him they mean they're telling it, it it means something to the cnc this is one aspect of the robotics math i'm talking about which is transformations uh, representing objects in space so you can see these coordinate frames over here and all Another aspect of where these mathematical concepts apply is if anyone over here is kind of interested in AI or doing AI at the moment, you might be familiar with, of course, self-driving cars, autonomous cars, and the field of computer vision and all. So let's say you have this table over here and you have this camera sitting right up top over here. 
So this is the view of the table as seen from the camera. Now each uh, car over here, the two cars here, each car has a certain direction where it's heading and a certain you could say orientation with respect to some reference. Let's say over here they've defined the reference here. So let's say this is the orientation that's defined, the default orientation you could say reference and this is the heading of each car. Now the camera would apply computer vision techniques once again related to transformations representing the orientation and heading or uh, more technically speaking the pose of the car and say even uh, let's say there's a camera on the car so every obstacle it would detect would be assigned say some position in space because the car would need to know how far that obstacle is now all these and also a uh, very uh, unusual application is in the field of orbital mechanics and aerodynamics it's not something that people think would uh, like translate from here at first glance but it actually does so to give here an example let's say that you have a space shuttle um, to give it a name let's okay let's say we are talking about the space shuttle challenger Oh no! Wait, uh, sorry, that uh, that one blew up. Uh, the Atlantis, okay, uh, the space shuttle at Atlantis, and let's say it has to uh, dock at the International Space Station over here. Now, of course, uh, the people at Houston would have to know uh, where the ISS is first of all, and then more importantly, how fast it's going, how fast Atlantis is going, and also how they are tilted so that the space shuttle can dock to the ISS efficiently. This also constitutes uh, rigid body motions, transformations, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, I'll explain all these terms later, so don't worry. Now, what do you actually require? Now that I've shown you what you can actually do, what do you actually require when you're starting out? Now, when you first take a look at any, say, introductory robotics course in a college, this is the only thing you see. I mean, it's all weird math theorems, concepts, uh, Grassoff's equation, theory of machines, kinematics of machines, all random stuff. But that is, I mean, I would say that's not a correct way to start with. I mean, it, it, it depends. I mean, they know better since they are in the field of education. But as an individual, what I feel uh, are good fields to read up on before you begin working in this are these topics now these are just technical terms that i've written here so that you can search them up on wikipedia each topic has a wikipedia list but to break it down vector spaces and fields is just a fancy name for the vector algebra that you did in class 10 and 12 dot product cross, cross product um like the volume of the parallel prepared and projecting vectors on spaces and stuff like that linear algebra is matrices like what you are i, I think even uh, matrices linear algebra and vector spaces are something that you guys are learning right now like you did uh, i think linear algebra maybe in the first year and uh, vector algebra right now in the second year calculus uh, simple uh, integral differential calculus um, differential equations partial differential equations and the like and geometry now this is just a, a wide name of, that i've given so that you can look it up uh, geometry is uh, you could say it's more related to the uh, coordinate system side like uh, say how you would represent say a triangle in the coordinate system based on uh, separate vectors and all that stuff and topology is quite simply put uh, the shape of shapes like uh, of, uh, you don't have to go really deep into this i've just uh, written this field just so you know that some uh, some portions of this field are applied in robotics but it's not something i have to read up uh, too much into like when i was reading topology i for the life of me couldn't understand why people are getting high over the fact that a coffee mug is the same quote unquote shape as a sphere i mean i just don't get it but I mean, let the mathematicians do their thing and the engineers will do theirs. And dyna dynamical systems is uh, once again a fancy name for the physics stuff that comes like uh, your speed, velocities, vectors, uh, how you differentiate displacement to get velocities and acceleration, etc, etc. Now, these are all the 
technical things that you need to read up and you will be reading while you're on this learning journey of robotics math but as an individual what i would say is you need more of this a lot of patience uh, because i'm telling you when i first started uh, reading about let's say, linear algebra like linear algebra okay something that we've done in 10th and 12th in detail the amount of information overload that i had it was mind boggling to say the least and of course if anyone is studying maths you have to be suicidal i mean okay see uh, on a lighter note it's not you don't have to be suicidal it's just that I mean, you need to be brave enough to bear the difficulties of learning math and uh, actually to be very frank uh, all the stuff that i'm talking about here is actually part of an introductory robotics course that is taught right here in mit in the mechatronics department uh, it's uh, called robotics 1 so if you have any friend who's from the mechatronics department you better catch him and hold him while you're studying because they will help you a lot they we actually done all this before so anyway starting with the first topic you could say the introductory introductory topic rigid body motion now this is essentially the basics of everything if you are strong in rigid body motion i can say uh, i can guarantee that the rest is going to be very very easy and what all stuff actually comes in rigid body motion is first of all uh, like i said mentioned before transformations uh, knowing where an object is in space with respect to something else or uh, some reference fr- frame or something so for example we have this uh, mobile robot here and you've got this uh, camera and some obstacle that this robot has to pick up now when you is if anyone here is familiar with computer vision what you would actually do here is you would define one world reference frame like how we have in in our standard cartesian coordinate system you define a origin 0 0 now after that you define where the camera is because obviously the you can alternatively define the camera as your origin because you're seeing everything from there but in the larger scale of things it's better to keep a common reference to everything and then you represent the camera uh, based on where it is at that time at that uh, point in space so the camera here would be let's say 3 meters like let's say x direction 5 meters y and 6 meters z somewhere in the corner of some roof now the mobile robot itself would have a different position and also it would also be moving so you'd also have to find out the relation between the movement of this with respect to the reference and then from here the robotic arm the gripper and of course where the obstacle is right this robotic arm here can reach down and pick this up that's the first area which is re- uh, coordinate system representation and um, the transformations knowing where things are in space and finding out relative representations like how far is this from here relative to let's say this frame this uh, body now after you do all that what Uh, the immediate thing that comes after this or rather alongside this is something called degrees of freedom now as the name suggests it's literally the degrees of freedom of a body like if you take say a random let's say your phone in space right the the phone can move in three directions x y z and it can also rotate in three axes the x axis y axis and uh, z axis now each movement each translation there are three translations and three rotations so you get a total of 6 degrees of freedom now when you are building mechanisms or robot and even representing stuff in general like if if you take this mobile robot for example this robot won't go up or like kind of turn uh, sideways or like do that goal mal type thing where it's on two wheels or anything so you are restricting that rotation or that movement so in this case you are restricting the movement about the z axis because you won't want it to lift up so you've restricted one degree of freedom so simplistically this is there is an equation for that which is called grubler's equation which ca- kind of calculates the degree of freedom that an object has after you put all the different constraints that you are having here for example if you take this thing here this is a planar mechanism 
of what I'm showing here is called a five bar because it's one, two, three, four, and five. Ground is the fifth uh, portion, you could say, of or link. And to calculate the degrees of freedom, because since it's a planar me mechanism, uh, three degrees of freedom get cut off because if you take a body in a plane, you have what x, y, and uh, some rotation that it can do theta. Over here, then you can. Uh, so if you take this joint here, this joint is restricted by this. This joint is restricted by this, and this joint is restricted by this, which is again restricted by ground. So you take all these constraints that are held on each link. And then you accumulate all of them. There's a equation for that. And then you get this big, this one number that tells you that okay, uh, the num the degrees of freedom of this mechanism, uh, talking about the five bar in particular, it is two. Uh, for a four bar, which is uh, one, two, three, and the ground is four, that is one. The, the degree of freedom of a five bar is two. Four bar is one. Now, why is this so important? That I will explain when we get to something called velocity kinematics or forward kinematics and inverse kinematics. So just keep that uh, at the back of your head for now. Now, when I mentioned topology, this is what I was referring to. Now, uh, this is just a mathematical concept, so it's not really uh, transferable to the physical world, but it's a good thing to think about because this kind of uh, it's kind of indirectly related to degree of freedom and also how you interpret it in equations. And of course, this is just another aspect that I mentioned uh, about transformations. So let's say that your block here is on its side. Now, obviously, the frame here depict, depicting that uh, obstacle, sorry, it would be different. It would be rotated differently. Now, how do you represent that rotation with respect to this frame? It's usually represented as from here, how do I get to that? Simple as that. And of course, there are many different methods of doing it. Over here, there are two where you can uh, do uh, tr this transformation with respect to the reference that you're doing it, or you can manipulate the frame itself. Now, for example, if you take this frame and I wanted this to move uh, five meters along the x axis. Now, over here, you need to define which x axis, this x axis or this x axis. And depending on that, you have many different uh, motions of frames and stuff like that. And over here is another different uh, way of looking at this. Over here, we are looking at coordinate frames. Over here, we are looking at uh, coordinate frames and their application on vectors. So if I have some vector here, now this translates to say uh, this robotic arm here is applying some force in this direction and it's also rotating. So how does that force that the gripper is applying transfer when it, the arm is also rotating. So this is just uh, some diagram depicting that you have angular mechanics, simple angular mechanics that you've done in 12th. Huh. Also, uh, you don't need any high five math to do all of this to begin with. You just need your 12th level basic as whatever you've done in your first year. So don't get overwhelmed by all this. Now, say that I have this arm over here. I don't worry about the matrices. I'll explain them in a bit. Now, let's say that I have to reach. Let's say if we take our own arm, for instance, and I have to pick up my phone, which is uh, lying here in front of me. Now, how do I know that I have to move, say, uh, 10 centimeters to pick up that phone? Now, that is something which falls under the purview of forward kinematics, which is uh, literally uh, finding out uh, the end effector which is the end of this robot so this is usually called the end effector if you take see any industrial arm you'll probably find this end effector having some drill bit or some welding tool so in the end effector usually means the end of the robot and knowing say if i turn my elbow say 30 degrees and my wrist 40 degrees up where is does my end effector lie but in this case the end effector is my hand so that falls under the purview of forward kinematics, which is literally you're adjusting these thetas here, the joint angles, which you can see here, theta one, theta three and all that. So theta one is this first joint, theta two is the second joint and so on. And you find out what overall effect does this have 
on the final position of the end effector over here. So let's say I move this by 30 degrees. So this 30 degree would affect this in some way. Then let's say I move this down by 40 degrees. So this is plus 30 minus 40. And these would also interact with each other and give some final effect. So this is just a very simplistic example that I've given of a three joint robot. So one, two, and three. And also uh, there are many different types of uh, robots that you can get. For example, this one has turning joints, which are technically called revenue joints. You have uh, one which has sliding joints. So if you uh, if you can search up, say, uh, oh, so if, if any of you are in the mechanical scene, you might have visited the workshop at some point in time. And if you take, say, uh, one of the machines that, that they use, they're called a shaper. The the thing slides, so it goes back and forth. Now, the, the reason it can go back and forth is because of something called a sliding joint, technically called a prismatic joint. So this turning joint, the turning pair or revenue joint and this prismatic joint are kind of the essentials of joints. All other uh, joints are derived out of this. You either have a rotation or a transition. I mean, what else would you have other than that? So this is Okay, so what I'm showing here right now is two ways you can two uh, industry standard you could say ways for kinematics is actually calculated. The first one over here is called uh, Denovate Hartenberg parameters. Uh, this was uh, the first thing that actually came, the first method of representation of uh, how to calculate forward kinematics. And this is a direct application of the rigid body motion concepts that I spoke about previously. So let's say that this joint here is represented by this uh, frame, coordinate frame. And this joint here is represented by this coordinate frame. Now, if you remember, I talked about how to represent stuff, we have to think about from here, how do I get there? So this is one way of doing it. So over here, you rotate by some amount. And then, so after doing that, you translate a bit, you rotate again a bit and you translate again a bit. So it's a, it's a defined set of operations that directly converts this into this. And uh, those who are doing, um, who are in say the CS department right now, uh, not in MIT, but in universities abroad, this, uh, the introductory robotics course is actually taught to computer science students because uh, computer science students use this more because these frame assignments and all is something that's very easily done with computer vision, uh, frame assignment of pose assignment and all that. And they use this to, uh, to calculate in real time how the joints are moving. So if say this joint is rotating at one degree a second, so you can calculate that by uh, finding out by finding out the, the displacements of this frame over time and doing math on it again and finding it out. Now, this thing is something that came not recently, but it came after this, I would say. And what this has is something that is actually very useful for uh, calculation. Now, over here, thing is you have to do this entire process, this rotation translation. Okay, for before that, you have to assign frames. You have to do this rotation translation business and then you, you have to do this for every single joint of the robot. So, I mean, it's fine if you take the previous example, one, two, three joints, but say you have a snake bot. Now you can imagine how many uh, joints that snake bot has and imagine doing that, this process for say a hundred joints in real time. Now this, what this does is this eliminates the middleman. So these are the middlemen here. This method eliminates that. So you have just two things you have to keep in mind. One and the end effector. Two. Of course, this is a, a lot more uh, mathy than this one because this uses something called a matrix exponential, which I will talk about later. And using this matrix exponential, you don't have to individually represent uh, the transformation of each joint while you're going from here to here. You can just figure out where each joint is individually and then just sum them up in one shot. So you can see here, this is the effect that, so this is the exponential of this joint. This is the exponential of this joint and so on and so forth until you get to the end. Now, these are two, uh, this one is very good for math. 
this is very good for analysis because you need, you need to figure out on the spot what each joint is doing this is just where you just care about the overall result so where, uh, also most simulation software that you'll find or uh, online or, or everywhere will uh, utilize this system because like i said the analysis portion you can figure out each joint's effect and all now now that i've told you or talked to you about forward kinematics velocity kinematics is actually very similar to forward kinematics in that you just perform differentiation on the entire thing so it's a simple application of displacement you differentiate it you get velocity now forward kinematics was uh, if i if the joints have a certain value where is my end effector velocity kinematics is if my joints are moving at a certain velocity what will the velocity of my end effector be now over here i have demonstrated the uh, second method which is actually called product of exponentials because you have this exponential thing here and this is uh, you're essentially performing differentiation like this tss prime that you can see here and uh, uh, of course this is similar um, logic applies to the dh parameter thing also the quantized frame thing that i also showed they are just directly very similar to each other you just differentiate stuff and of course there's a lot of more uh, detail that comes into this but i'll get to that later now before i get into something called dynamics there's also one thing that i want to talk about which is something called the inverse problem in general uh, this applies to uh, kinematics and dynamics the inverse problem is like the name says in kinematics we talked about the joints giving the position of the end effector now the inverse problem is if the end effector is somewhere how do i know what joint angles caused that position or caused that movement now even if we talk about uh, dynamics there's also something called the inverse dynamics problem which is uh, before that let me just tell you what dynamics is the dynamics is forces like just forces you're analyzing what forces got this it's just like kinematics kinematics was uh, position and velocity kinematics was velocity dynamics is force so if my joints have say one newton two newton of force my end effector has say three five newtons of force something like that and this is actually very simple i mean uh, don't get scared by the graphs these are just like high fi representations of what you've actually done in class 10 i'd say which is the work energy theorem and the work energy theorem states that uh, change in i mean work equals increase in kinetic energy is work something along those lines right and this equation summates that so what you can see here this is the kinetic energy of that system in this case if you're evaluating a robotic arm it's a robotic arm and this is the potential energy of that robotic arm and once again this is some differentiation stuff you do here and this thing here is called the lagrangian and what's special about this lagrangian is you are actually quantifying the work energy theorem in class and what we did was simple kinetic energy equals uh, work right but we here what the lagrangian does is it actually establishes a quantitative relationship between kinetic energy and work as being force so it so the lagrangian establishes that force is the reason why this uh, kinetic energy is being transferred into work or like vice versa and this is why you uh, the lagrangian over here directly translates it into force here after you do differentiation and all now over here, what i'm showing over here is something called okay now names will differ depending on what field you're working in uh, the kinematics field or dynamics field in case of kinematics it's called a manipulability manipulability so from manipulator manipulability ellipse and it is literally tells you how easy it is to move in say a certain direction if we take this circle over here it's very easy to move everywhere and if we take say this ellipse here it's easy to move from here to here because see there's a lot of you can actually this is actually visual inspection that you're doing here it's very easy to move in this direction but it's not very easy to move in this direction so you can see the axis the length here is small and this is just some other intermediate positions now this applies to velocity also so if we take a, a velocity ellipse this is how much velocity we can give so in this case we can give lot of velocity over there 
and in this case not so much and when it comes out to dynamics this is a force ellipse you can apply a lot of force here but not so much force there and this is because of the configuration of the robotic arm itself so even if you take our arm if you try and extend it fully outward you can't uh, if you move this is i'm talking about if you move just your arm you can't push however if your arm is bent a bit you can push outwards but once it's fully outstretched you can't like push any more unless you want to break your elbow which is something that i wouldn't recommend so you could think about this as uh, a configuration of your um, arm being fully outstretched so you can you can move sideways very easily but you can't push outwards that much whereas here is more of an intermediate position where you can push pull move sideways etc and how this translates into the inverse dynamics problem is in real life it's actually very difficult to do this uh, trying to actually i mean sure on paper it's very easy but uh, how to verify this in the real world is something that even top researchers are unable to do uh, when it comes to the inverse problem now inverse kinematics is actually pretty well established but uh, inverse dynamics is something that is god awful difficult i mean uh, i mean as a student i would say it took me so long to figure out inverse kinematics and then i uh, figured out that all my effort was gone in vain because there was a research paper that i read which did the exact same thing i mean just to establish a point that inverse kinematics is very kinematics in general is very well established but dynamics isn't because this is kind of a new thing now this is something that uh, i think most ai people will be very familiar with which is motion planning motion planning trajectory generation and this is something that applies uh, kind of applies directly to wheeled or mobile robots but this also applies to robotic arms in the sense now if we take say this thing over here now this is a representation of a mobile robot say a roomba for example and these are i don't know why someone has a triangle sofa in their house but okay let's take it that way and say this roomba has to clean the house so it has to go from here to here and now these wide boundary lines you see here are a buffer for the roomba so you can see this roomba has some radius right so it have some size you wouldn't want this roomba to go into this obstacle so you this is one method of how you plan motion you establish you 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 find out how big your vehicle is or your robot is and then you create a sort of pillow cushion type thing or i think it's called a bounding box in uh, cs language i'm not really sure you can check up on that and you uh, essentially set boundaries for the robot to follow this is one uh, aspect of the problem and what you can see here uh, i okay yeah so what you can see here is uh, to the right of what i showed you this triangle thing here that is say you have a triangle shaped uh, robot now the the dotted lines that you see here are all the various ways that that uh, vehicle can uh, cross that obstacle and of obviously the efficiency of how it traverses that obstacle depends on how it's angled at that point of time now this is of course another uh, aspect of the motion problem if you have an irregularly shaped robot how would you want to point it towards an obstacle so that you don't have to expend a lot of effort and this irregularity is very uh, well defined in robotic arms over here because obviously you won't have everything the same length uh, uh, for uh, various reasons manipulability issues and say the kinematics the dynamics and all that stuff you will get to know while you actually designing and modeling this stuff so this is a direct application of this problem where you have a robotic arm with some uh, various lengths and what you can see here are the various uh, configurations that the arm is doing when it moves from here to here and this uh, white thing that you see, you are seeing here is a visual representation of this on a graph now uh, i didn't talk about graphs even though you've seen probably one or two while i was talking but the these things here correspond with that little donor thing that i showed you when we were talking about rigid body motions that is something called a configuration space which is literally the space of all possible configurations a robot can take now it's a mathematical concept but how it physically uh, translates into the real world is something called a workspace 
which is literally all the points the robot can reach and how easily the robot can reach that specified point is determined by the ellipses that i showed you and this is a visual representation of how uh, that thing kind of comes now this portion here oh, so this portion was the motion planning portion this here is uh, something that i think most people with an electronics background might uh, be familiar with this over here is uh, something called uh, motor control and well, it it's kind of motor control but uh, you learn about this while you're learning motor control but this same concept translates into trajectory planning which is literal what as the name suggests you uh, are planning a path like a little gps direction thing for the arm to follow when you're going from point a to point b so let's say i'm to go from the top of this m to the top of this t and then i want to go to g so what to go here here and then curve around and come here so that comes into trajectory planning and there are many ways you can plot this trajectory either you can make the word go straight b line 1 2 or you can make the word trace a more a curved path to make it smoother so something like that and there are many ways you can actually calculate this thing on a graph so here there are two methods one is a polynomial method where you use a uh, cubic polynomials or quintic polynomials quintic is a uh, fourth or fifth degree if i remember correctly and this is uh, uh, another separate method called the trapezoidal uh, profile this is the polynomial uh, profile this is the trapezoidal profile and the uh, the and actually if if you see um, industrial arms they use a trapezoidal profile because one uh, drawback that the polynomial thing has is although it is the smoothest path you will ever get you will not be able to reach the full um to say capabilities of the robot so the robot's motors i'm talking about it just doesn't it's a property of the method itself you will so if your uh, uh you could say if you you have some motors the polynomial profile will only Uh, allow your motors to go up to 70%. So I mean 30% is wasted money and uh, wasted money you could say. So the trapezoidal profile takes care of that by allowing your mot your motors of your robot to work at their full potential. Also one uh, one drawback of that is that you see these sharp curves here. These sharp sorry corners here. Now they introduce something called jerk. So if you are going in a car and you brake suddenly that is what i'm talking about here that uh, feeling of jerkiness while the robot is traveling and there are ways you can smooth this over and to illustrate a difference if you look at these two parts here uh, these two parts are uh, different not by the method but by how you want the robot to move at that point so if you take the first case for example at this point i want my robot to move in this direction specifically this direction and this uh, point i want the robot to move specifically in that direction so depending on what uh, profile you use it calculates a path accordingly whereas in this case if i specify the path like this and like this you can see the path is more smoother it's much more smoother so oh, also uh, there are two ways that this that you usually do trajectory generation one is point to point which is literally point a to point b that's it you let the rest of the algorithms and models do the work and another is via points which is what you can see here you specify via points for the robot to travel to uh, if, when you want to kind of manually tweak stuff and this is where specifying what direction you want the robot to go to at that point is very important because you can see how the vast difference i mean this doesn't look like much but when you say working in a factory where even one second can mean a thousand pieces left unmanufactured so this saves a lot of time one second is a lot of time in manufacturing perspectives now the, what i to, uh, talked about right now was i guess mostly uh, mechanically oriented like forces velocities and stuff but if you are an electronics engineer and you want to get into robotics then you also have math related to that and if uh, any of uh, of you are i mean if any of you are in the third year right now you might have come across something called linear control theory 
which is literally what I'm showing here. You have, and uh, if you're a second tier, you will get it later. If we are say, even if you're in the mechanical or electrical streams, and what control systems actually do is so first of all, if we think about say the a robot as a collection of three subsystems, you could say AI, electronics, mech. Mech is the body, AI is the cognition, and electronics is the actuation, the circuitry of your robot. And how is it that say uh, you have some sensors on your gripper which tells you, which gives you pressure uh, feedback of pressure, how hard you want to grab something. Now translating the feedback that the sensor gives to your internal whatever microcontroller that you're using to control the robot and uh, giving some appropriate output back that comes under the purview of control systems now obviously you have many other uh, things like which you probably m might have heard like uh, proportional integral differential control or like pid control you also have an, a lot of other things like position control where you uh, uh, prioritize your control system to uh, see just the position velocity control for velocity and force control for force now they kind these control systems apply to different situations like position is just for point to point stuff uh, velocity is kind of when you want to trace a path specifically and force control is almost always used in grippers when you want to uh, grab a, an object with a certain amount of force now uh, the response time of your uh, control system to the stimulus that you're providing is actually very difficult to tweak and the what the technical term for that is i mean loosely speaking it's called damping now when you if you have say a normal system now this we are getting into normal class 12 physics here if i take say a pendulum or say any like periodic vibrational system and i disturb it i provide some stimulus to it some constant stimulus to it now from its resting position it would start to travel to that uh, uh, that common stimulus uh, value that have uh, defined and it doesn't reach there uh, in one go it reaches it overshoots a bit the, the if you are talking about even physical systems and even when you're talking about from a electronics perspective or signals perspective it reaches that value it kind of shoots a bit and then it uh, settles to that thing to the value that you define a very good uh, example i think would be a guitar string like you uh, provide some stimulus to the guitar string and uh, from its resting position it'll start moving a bit and then it settles to some value which is in that case is the uh, resting place again now there are ways that you can manually uh, tweak this thing this overshoot portion so that you don't kind of go too much like you can see over here this is an under damped system as in i have not provided any manual tweaking to the system at all so it's going to take forever to reach your specified value then you have something called overdamped, which is this top thing here that I'm showing, uh, which is actually kind of good, but uh, it takes too long to reach your specified value. And time is once again something that is very important response time when you're talking about say legged robots and stuff. Because if you if you if you're uh, if you are one second late or one millisecond late rather, your robot will fall over. Uh, like even when we are walking, if you have just if you space out for like a moment, you find yourself falling down the stairs or something. So the finding out the critically damped uh, portion is once again something that you have to tweak manually and this is something that as a control systems engineer so this field of engineering is called control systems engineering you will get to know all this and you'll get to learn all this now this is just another kind of schematic representation of this and this is or you could say oh this is this thing is how you represent this so any mechanical system any physical system that's there you represent it as a block diagram like this and you translate this block diagram into electronic components so over here say some mass here right you would uh, have something like a resistor or in the case of a spring you have an inductor capacitor stuff like that so you translate mechanical objects into electronic components and that's how you start with the control systems thing now that all of this is done uh, why uh, i wanted to why i want to bring grasping and manipulation specifically like as a subject is because uh, from mathematical point of view there is a lot of stuff that you can do math from a uh, 
mechanical mathematics point of view because uh, if you see if you've studied bme you must remember that your teeth have types of contact like line contact and uh, in the case of helical gears that line travels around so you get less sound now uh, why that thing works is because of something called contact mechanics which is what i'm showing here so over here you can see the various types of contact that two bodies can have this is point contact this is another type of point contact which can translate into surface contact so this triangle here if i bring this a bit to the a bit up so this will make surface contact with you this is proper surface contact or cylinder rolling on a plane this is also another type of uh, surface contact which is sliding and this is another type of point contact this and this have different uh, mechanics even though they look the same and uh, once again uh, this is the contact this is the actual abstract uh, logic portion when you apply it in robotics what you can see here are these these uh, triangles that is here this uh, these small triangles and this uh, rectangle are uh, fingers of a gripper so of course there are many types of grippers that you can make uh, the most common one is the two fingered one also in two fingered ones you have different types also like toggle grip uh, parallel grip angular grip stuff like that the which you can look up by yourself and so this is literally applying applying these contact mechanics concepts over here so you can see uh, the gripper here has pointed fingers much like here so this is kind of analogous to this situation and this situation is here once again and this is sort of similar to this and this once again sort of similar to this. so there are many ways that you can uh, tweak your uh, your fingers of your gripper to kind of make the most out of the contact mechanics and where this comes in is say you're dealing with soft robotics okay and of course with soft robotics you have deformable objects now depending on the material you use you would have say uh, i don't know rubber silicon some whatever uh, material you're using for your gripper and the thing is that they have they would have some roughness right or some friction between the, the object they're holding and the grip the gripper's fingers themselves so that influences all the contact mechanics like over here you can see all the frictional forces that are being applied over here at this end you have this reaction force coming from here here like etc etc this is kind of a more uh, mechanically oriented thing the mathematics of robotics but uh, like you can see the they apply to other fields as well like body rigid body transformations are ap applicable in ai kinematics dynamics uh, force control and all that electronics things even grasping and manipulation are kind of a amalgamation of all ai electronics and mech stuff like like in this case you would have force control for your grasping now there are many applications of uh, robotics where you can directly apply this sort of math and the first one is of course manipulators manipulators being uh, the robotic arms that you see around every day so stuff like uh, like say ascara which is uh, a se selectively compliant articulated robotic arm the fancy name you can look at up what it actually means and you have other types of robots which use directly apply the principles that i talk about right now then you have autonomous ground vehicles which are in a way the wheeled robots that i talked about and you have self driving vehicles and all that now a uh, new you could say field is something related to uh, bio inspired stuff which is quadrupeds bipeds and swarms and this is for to do this you kind of need a biology background so when you're talking about bio inspired design biomimetics biomechanics or stuff like that you need kind of need a uh, biology background but not that much it's more so you can understand the mechanics of why that biological system works so if you take swarm for example and you compare it to an ant colony ants communicate with pher uh, pheromones if i have uh, pronounced that correctly yeah and knowing how the pheromones uh, come uh, work with each other and how the ants communicate with each other you can this is kind of an ai application that i am talking about but you can model an entire swarm of mini robots based on that same ant colony um, 
system pheromone system and uh, now bio inspired design biomechanics they directly apply to uh, exoskeletons prosthetics uh, st stuff like that so these directly interact with the human body in some way like if to give you a very i don't know uh, mass media example if any of one of you has played assassin's creed the hidden blade that the, the the assassins have you could call it a pretty rudimentary application of biomechanics because you have to design the blade in such a way that it doesn't cut your finger off i mean it used to but now it doesn't i mean you get my point right and also one thing okay and these one very good aspect of robotics as a field is when you learn one thing you learn everything like it's not that if if say you start learning the mechanical portion you stick just to the mechanical portion you get exposed to both the ai portion and the electronics portion like just uh, sitting here right now i can kind of i can tell you the difference between a uh, cnn and rnn and talk about control systems overshoot settling time uh, damping etc and i can also talk about uh, mechanical stuff like uh, roughness ductility brittleity so as a roboticist as a robotics engineer you you can you can start specializing in one field but you do get uh, the experience of all three so this is just uh, just illustration of what i was talking about this is the scara that i'm talking about and this is a mathematical uh, a kinematic diagram this thing is called a kinematic diagram where you actually show the um, various angles of the joints of the robot and how it can actually move and stuff so this thing over here is actually a prismatic joint so this thing here uh, you might recognize this from bme as a screw um, a screw joint yeah the screw joint where you have a, or a worm and worm wheel if that rings a bell so you have got these threads here and then you have another uh, worm here which uh, rotates and then this moves now Uh, once again autonomous ground vehicles and this is just another mathematical diagram now this uses more uh, transformations and rigid body motions whereas manipulators use more of the latter part forward kinematics dynamics and all and like i mentioned by inspired design uh, this is actually very uh, as of now there is a lot of work being done into exoskeletons like we here this is just a simple example i've shown of a exoskeleton being graphed on a not exoskeleton more like a, a mechanism modeling the human finger and over here this is a render, rendering of a person walking through you see so if you probably seen games where they show behind the scenes stuff they do something called motion capture and this is a screenshot of one of the motion capture applications where the person here is walking and the cameras and uh, you probably seen they have this big black jumpsuit type thing and they wear some um, ec eeg type helmet on the head with all the white dots and everything and this is what this actually turns out to be in the computer so you model uh, gates so gate analysis and uh, gate analysis also comes in quadrupeds bipeds and etc now uh, contrary to what other people might tell you that you should read research papers i will actually recommend not to because the math in research papers is actually too high level i mean if you want to read about the math math research papers where they actually may uh, invent new mathematical techniques but if you are interested in uh, find so uh, the math stuff that i talked about most of it is applied mathematics that we are doing here we aren't Uh, really studying math for the sake of it like mathematicians do most of uh, robotics research in this field is mostly control system equations or uh, making new mechanisms like new ways of doing the same thing like say if you take this joint here you can actuate it by just putting a motor there or putting some system of gears or doing some other tufani which i probably don't even know yet has been invented yet so uh, you get the idea so i would recommend reading first before you start reading research papers i mean you can if you want uh, but do that just to get an idea of what topics you need to read on don't read a research paper for uh, research paper purposes because most of the math will kind of go over your head 
unless you're doing our application thing in which case they talk less about the math math and more of how that math is applied which is something that i will actually recommend reading application based research papers more than uh, theory theory research papers and what i'm showing here now is actually um, this is the, the paper that you could say uh, invented dh parameter so it was made by jacques I don't know if I pronounced that correct. Jack is uh, Denavit and uh, Richard Hartenberg. The frame stuff that I talked to you about. And so this is actually a very good paper that you can read if you want to kind of understand how matrices and stuff are applied. This is the product of exponentials uh, paper by Roger V. Brockett. Once again, this is more math related compared to the DS parameters one. But I will actually recommend reading these two papers because you... Uh, kind of clear up a lot of your math concepts along with uh, knowing how these formulae came to be which is something that's very important if you want to internalize what you're reading and uh, visualizing it and now uh, this looks very sparse but this guy osama khatib is you could say the darling child of robotics in a way because his papers are instrumental in paving the field like if you look him up on Scopus, he has like 270 papers from dating from 1986, if I remember correctly. And each paper is like, like his top cited papers are like 4K, 5K papers, which is crazy considering that you get a hundred and your paper is like really good. So imagine four, 5K. And what he's showing here is actually something that I uh, forgot to talk about when talking about uh, AGVs, which is something called a potential field. Um, yeah, potential field, artificial potential field. Now, this here is actually a representation of an obstacle. And here, so, ob so an obstacle means you can't go there. So that's why the potential over here is very high, visually speaking. And over here, there's also free space. So there's no potential. And this is one application of how this translates to here. So these walls here, they would come up no, they would show up like this, like big wall type things on the graph. And this free space over here would come up as free space. So I would actually uh, recommend reading these three because they, in my opinion, cover everything that is to know about the basics of robotic math, like the DH and POE product of exponential stuff. They cover everything about like the inner math workings and also how that inner math translates to actual uh, physical world. And this uh, talks more about the, uh, you could say in a way AI and electronics bit because you have to know how to detect these obstacles and representing them in a graph and con more importantly controlling your robot based on this observation. So that's it for like an introduction. I think I went a bit overboard in preparing this presentation. But if you do join our Discord server, I am pretty active over there. So if you have any questions about there, actually there are a few papers that uh, have been put up in our robotics channel over there, which I would actually suggest you reading through. And I also put a lot of uh, learning resources up there for you to go through uh, if you want to when if and when you want to start learning robotics. So yeah, uh, that's about it. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Nihal, for that amazing session. I think people really got to know an actual behind the scenes of what robotics is, you know, rather than just what we see or just the products. So coming to uh, uh, questions now, we'll first start with the questions in the form. So Aman Priyanshu, I see he has posted a question here as well. I'll first start with his question in the paper uh, in the form. Uh, resources to explore the mathematics behind uh, robotics for research, like journals, publications, conferences, or collection of projects for inspiration. Like, what would you suggest? Okay, so um, all right. So to begin with, uh, actually, uh, I kind of answered my own question at the end of the uh, this own question at the end of the presentation. Uh, the Discord channel has I have actually listed a big list of the learning resources that you can go through in the robotics channel and if you are talking about a research perspective there is this one uh, handbook called uh, springer handbook to robotics uh, it's by um, bruno siciliano if i remember correctly 
and that is literally an overview of everything that is there in the research field in robotics there are also a, a number of offshoots like uh, swarm intelligence swarm intelligence legged robots and all but i would say if you want to look at it from a research perspective this is the book to go through and of course uh, there are many other books that you can refer to when you're talking about like the maths aspect so for example if you're interested in uh, say the modeling portion like the kinematics and all you can look at uh, uh books that deal with theory of machines now uh one little fun fact the, the most of the robotics matter that you see here is directly derived from mecha- the field of mechanical engineering where you actually model stuff like pistons and axles and stuff so a lot of stuff that you see here is uh, applied mechanical engineering uh, math so yeah i guess that uh, kind of answers uh, the question yeah and uh, i think his yeah his question is almost same the one which he has asked but uh, like any recommendations on more which on books or uh, you know any uh, resources more focused on like the ai part of robotics okay ai so um okay ha huh. so in the there so there are i would say there are three main resources that at least i went through while learning robotics Uh, the first one is the introduction to robotics course uh, by stanford university it is taught by the usama khatib and you can find it on youtube and that gives that that first of all gives an overall view the ai portion in in a bit uh, like the uh, the dh parameter stuff uh, the control bit and the mechanical bit however if you looking more towards ai uh, i can or uh, recommend the i can recommend the second uh, resource that i read which is i guess more related towards uh, computer vision uh, this one is uh, done by peter cock he is a computer vision scientist at uh, queenston institute of technology australia queensland sorry and uh, his uh, book his book and also his course he has a robotics uh, course on qut robot academy you can look at you can google it and he also has a related book and a math lab a math lab toolbox to go along with it which focuses on computer vision concepts like uh, rigid body transformations homogeneous transformations and stuff like that so if you are interested in the computer vision aspect this is one thing that i can recommend to you straight off the bat Hello. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think, guess I, I think my uh, the net net fluctuated for a while. Um, okay, so coming to next question, it's by Dhruvajit Ghosh, and he has asked about hardware implementation in robots. Oh, okay. Now this is a nice one because uh, when we talk about hardware, it hardware can mean actually. Uh, when we talk about hardware, it's mostly electronics bit. but i will also want to talk about i'll first talk about the uh, mechanic i'll talk about the electronics bit then move on to what the mechanical definition definition of hardware is uh, when we talk about uh, the electronics implementation of hardware in robotics it's uh, very simple in a way like even for the research project that we did uh, over at mrm we got away with an arduino I mean, it wasn't. I mean, which it was very uh, anti-climatic. Like we were expecting to use some uh, high-class uh, PIC microcontrollers and uh, some high fancy robot control stuff. But we kind of got away with an uh, with an Arduino Uno and uh, some you know, UART SPI protocols. I'm not really sure about that. But uh, the point is, hardware implementation in robotics, unless you are going like really, really legit, is very simple. when you uh, are making research projects oh yeah uh, when you are making research projects uh, i would suggest going for proof of concept first because proof of concepts are very easy to implement you can just uh, do stuff with arduinos and simulations and stuff and even when uh, when i when you talk about the mechanical portion of hardware which is like fabricating the parts for proof of concept projects you can just do 3d printing and call it a day but if you are looking for an actual uh, uh, phys- physical like um, like a pilot program or you all want to make and manufacture manufacture ready that is uh, actually less robotics research stuff and more of uh, like mechanical stuff because uh, it's more pure mechanical engineering like figuring out tolerances and actually 
knowing what uh, material is good for your robot but yeah the two uh sum it up i think uh hardware is not going to be a problem you can get away with arduinos and normal stepper motors like if you're just uh, starting out of course uh, money is a problem because uh, well uh, no uh, good quality motors are very expensive like for example there's this top of the line uh harmonic drive motor that uh, we were just looking at and this harmonic drive motor is actually used in industrial arms like proper industrial arms each arm uh, each drive costs like 30k so and we were making a 7 degree of freedom arm which is seven joints uh, simply put so 30k into 7 that's almost what 2 lakhs maybe so the point is unless you're going really legit it's very easy and rather cheap to get hardware for robotics implementations Uh, okay so next question we have by uh, isha billa and she has asked for a complete beginner who wants to get into the field of fully automated robots where would you suggest starting i am confused if i should start learning about ml first or i should focus on electronics part first but again i am not sure how to progress to robot level in any of those fields So any pointers about uh, direction would be appreciated. Okay, so if you're talking about full autonomy, that would uh, okay. So I would say the easiest bit to start with would be actually the math portion. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're talking about uh, uh, like if you're going individually, uh, because it's best to get that portion out of the way because uh, one actually I think flaw would be is that. this field is not uh, well established when it comes to the learning path like if we talk about um, applied ai like computer vision stuff it's very simple do andrew ng's course read these many papers do the ros tutorials you're set or if electronics is a bit more iffy like you do the arduino the stuff you learn about control theory and the mechanical bit this math portion is more much more difficult so um, if i were to say i think on the other hand i think it would be better if you can start with the ai portion first why because uh, when you if when you come to the computer vision bit you can uh, not only do the peter cox thing that i mentioned which is actually uh, this robotics math geared towards computer vision but you will also be able to directly apply this uh, whatever you're learning in a simulation environment because of course you'd be learning uh, ros and stuff on the side and that is actually i think good because you can directly uh, visualize everything that you're doing like one problem that we had was we got these equations but we had no idea how to actually visualize them or let alone implement them and ros actually helped us a lot later on so i think it would be better if you started the ai side of things ai side of things and the peter cox course because he touches on the mechanical math but you are still t- staying true to the computer vision aspect and the ai simulation aspect um so ai side of things as in i go through the andrew ng route and then uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. uh actually i am not sure about the ml uh, portion i mean that's not like my area of expertise but you can definitely go along the computer vision route like to the peter cox course and uh, do like ros rs and stuff because you can directly apply the initial bit at least like the rigid body motions and the forward kinematics that i was talking about uh, you you why you can uh, make something called a uh, urdf uh, universal robot descriptor format if i remember the full form correctly and what it does is the robot arm that you've designed it uh, converts it into dh representation like each joint is a frame and you can represent the movement of that frame in ros r is whatever uh, like computer vision thing you're doing or like simulation thing you're doing so i think it's bet uh, it's best if you can uh, start with the ai bit like the andrew ng stuff uh, read the research papers do ros and all because you be able to apply stuff faster that way uh, thank you yeah i mean adding on to what nihal said because i literally <laughs> worked beside him for a while with him 
um i agree i think i have seen like uh, them like the you know the robotics or the mechanical portion of the robotics like they required a lot of time to understand the mathematics and you know even after implementing it to actually make it functional like what i noticed is they needed a lot of time because it's not that easy so if you are looking for like something that you can learn quickly uh, you know to implement then yeah definitely the ai side is more advisable and uh, in general ai has a lot of applications so you can use it in other places also and in particular to robotics i think ros is the most important like what i have noticed and known uh, right nehal if i'm not wrong yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely the yeah, ros so, is used everywhere yeah so more than you know that uh, more than the typical uh, like andrew ng co- what uh, machine learning or ai you will learn from andrew ng course like learning ros and then learning these uh, uh, you know like he mentioned computer vision like certain functions which are related to robotic that like that caters more towards robotics ros and all that so yeah just added my two cents and uh, yeah last question that we have in the form is a pretty interesting one so kumar nikhil asked could bots replace most of the jobs in workforce area in near future since ai has brought many revolutionary changes yeah okay <laughs> टेक्नोलॉजिकल एडवांसमेंट दैट सिविलाइजेशन सैड ओवर दर्स इन माई ओपिनियन दिस इज मोर एन एथिक्स क्वेश्चन ऑफ एथिक्स देन एक्चुअल लाइक टेक्की स्टफ बिकॉज ओके सो सिंस यू मैं ए आई इन द क्वेश्चन Let's say that you have designed an AI model using the top of the line AI model, that whatever, uh, uh, re- reinforcement learning, dal do, transfer learning, dal do, kuch bhi dal do. And the point is, if you and let's say you make this model do therapy, okay, like therapy for patients with mental illnesses and that, you may won't do good. I mean. I mean, this is. I'm just giving. Uh, like, I don't know exactly how it works, but in my opinion, you the AI model won't do as good as an actual human therapist because one advantage that we humans have is the presence of empathy, emotions, uh, connecting with each other on the spiritual level. So, a human would be able to connect better and help uh, that person better than any advanced AI model could do. This also applies to. Uh, other fields like say teaching or like say concierge work i mean yeah if we talk about the brute force things like uh, say recommender algorithms and uh, so so that stuff can be done by ai i mean it's better if it's done by ai i mean i can't imagine uh, one poor sort sitting in a cubicle somewhere in i don't know uh, noida uh, clicking on uh, specific things to show to person x i mean i mean yeah so uh, when it comes to like uh, the, the replacement of uh, humans by ai it I, at least i can tell you that it's not going to be that way we will be working alongside each other because one thing that ai uh, i think does is it works according to rules and those rules are something that we humans make so it, it they may outperform us computationally but we still are the ones in control and even when it comes to jobs if we talk about say data science okay like since it's a big thing right now now data science as a field it could take like jobs where the this stuff was previously done ma- uh, manually but on the other hand the data science field itself is creating new jobs like people who maybe would have lost their job because of an data science application they can now upskill or reskill themselves to become data scientists and now we have a lot of online resources like coursera and all that so Uh, it's more of a shift in what jobs we humans will be taking it's not like a loss in jobs actually if i for if i've read some metrics correctly jobs have actually increased because we've got i mean ha huh, uh, field specific jobs can be different but jobs in general the number of jobs have actually increased because of these new technologies that are coming like uh, say exoskeletons ai and all that 
so yeah point is <laughs> we won't have a terminator type scenario where like machines rule everything but yes we will be working alongside them in a very close capacity that is something that i can predict for with some degree of certainty yeah i think i mean that was the best way you could have summed it up honestly and uh, any uh, more questions uh, here or we'll wrap up the session If there are any more questions you can even uh, you know unmute and ask now it's fine aman priyanshu says i'm sorry i did not get the name of the cv researcher peter Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Peter Cork, so C O R K E, or you could just search up Q U T Robot Academy and you'll find him over there only. He also has a website called uh, Peter Dash Cork dot com where he has his uh, uh, textbook uh, robotics, uh, um, robotics vision and control in MATLAB, something like that. And he has his MATLAB toolbox which you can download from there. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, the question section has turned into a a nice discussion zone. <laughs> But uh, I don't think any more questions are there. Uh, yeah. there wasn't any question from my side. Okay. Oh. No, it's fine. You go ahead. Carry on, please. Acha, cool. Uh, so yeah, Nehal, you talked about uh motion planning, and people have been recently implementing machine learning and. We're shifting towards probabilistic robotics, where uh, uh, we're dealing with a completely different type of mathematics now that we're talking about maths altogether. So uh, this this one thing really confuses me. Say, uh, say, say you talked about DH notations and uh, all, all the transforms, and when you actually start to implement it, how much of math is enough? I realize that's a very broad question, but and it comes with experience. But yeah, I mean, still, that's a question, I guess. I mean, how do you know that? Uh, yeah, I think. I hope oh, I made sense. Okay, wait, wait. Uh, so uh, you mean to? Uh, so to kind of rephrase your question, if if okay, now that you've learned it, while implementing what you've actually learned, what all stuff will you actually need to learn on the job, kind of? Um. Yeah, sort of. Say when you're dealing with ROS packages and say, say any 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 algorithm, say pick up. Uh, say we have gamma filters. So you've got a ROS package for that. It does the job for you. And so, so you are you are in this uh, trade-off where how much of mathematics you need to understand and how much of software fluency you need to actually get things working um, on the field. So uh, I, I I saw you're part of MRM right now. So how do you guys actually make that trade-off? Because uh, we I mean we are engineers, right? And you said that let the mathematicians do their job. So Where where is that line? I mean, and when do you know you? Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, okay, ha ha. Okay, so to be completely fair, uh, हमारी औकात नहीं है कुछ तूफानी करने की. So actually, so this stuff that we learn is actually purely for implementation. As an undergraduate researcher, unless you have an IQ of say three hundred or something, we can't really contribute much. So when it comes to new uh, math stuff or like new actually learning math stuff, but we can find out new applications. Like for example, uh, the the arm that we worked on, the autonomous arm, th- that has actually been done before and is actually in production quality. Like if uh, Kuka and uh, I think Fanuk, if I remember correctly, they yeah. have seven degree of freedom arms. So I mean, what made us different? What we sought to do was find out a new application for the arm, which in this case was home environments, working like putting this arm, this big arm that we have, into a home environment for working with humans. Now, uh, math-wise, all we I, since this was fully in-house, we only uh, up used. Uh, we only used the stuff. We didn't kind of make our own stuff because I mean, see, frankly speaking, as an engineer, why would you want to make something when Something is already there to use. Like, like you said, if we talk about inverse kinematics, um, the ROS ha- has, if I remember correctly, something called fast IK or something, which calculates the inverse kinematics for you. So it it kind of makes learning inverse kinematics kind of pointless. But I will, I won't say don't learn it because 
uh, thing is these uh, algorithms i mean whatever uh, we use in the software they are kind of generalized to a lot of applications like even if you take um, i think ross or something uh, if i remember correctly it it is configured to work with the uh, panda arm I, th- i don't know i don't know if i'm if i said what i said correctly it. Ha ah, yeah sorry yeah move it yeah so move it's it. tailored for the panda arm right and of yeah. course it uh, translates to other arms too but not as well so we have to kind of in the end make stuff from scratch while using what is already there as a crutch so i mean of course the uh, so so if i were to answer your question yes we do need to learn but not so much ki we have to design everything from scratch we can uh, if you are saying thinking of a research paper project you can stick to the um, actual like just a basic modeling stuff if you want to document that thing in your paper but uh, like as a student researcher is best if you focus your research on new applications or like even ha huh, one thing that i forgot to mention was this uh, stuff can also enable you to do something in the patent field and patent field yani the uh, new mechanism thing because you can use the same uh, concepts that you learned like say you have a four bar right now that four bar you can model with the ds parameter whatever now if you add something new that is not only a good research like idea you can also patent it and this would actually require some uh, math chops from your side you can't rely on uh, software for this of course once you figure out the model putting that model and simulating that model can be done by the software but you have to do some of the brunt work in that case but if it's doing new applications you don't have to do ma- uh, math from scratch there are softwares that take care of it for you yeah cool cool because um, i mean all of us we've, we've studied for j and then we 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 uh, dived into that that kind of math and then uh, coming to an engineering college you know, it's just it's just that imposter syndrome walking you down and it just doesn't feel like that you have actually done it if you don't understand the math okay yeah. okay so okay since you're on this topic of je you actually yeah. don't need uh, je uh, math and stuff I, no 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 i was uh, attributing it to je but uh, just uh-huh. just the way we've been taught so far so uh-huh. yeah yeah we we have not Actually, developed uh, any applicative intuition about it unless uh, you actually start making things But yeah, yeah actually you. all the math that we uh, are talking about here is actually very physical math like stuff like vector and stuff there uh, the stuff like probability and arithmetic season on uska naam nishan hi nahi hai like unless you uh, like do the product of exponential one which like i mentioned was very mathy to begin with but actually you can stick uh, i mean, that that in a way that's what i like about math you don't have to remember stuff like in, in if you ask me any of the equations like what that does that equation mean i won't know a clue but seriously because i just let the software do the work for me why should i bother remembering everything but uh, it's more important to know the concept behind what each thing actually does so that you can know where to look more important thing is instead of knowing is knowing where to look so yeah 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 and one more thing so uh, apart from student projects which are sort of out of the scope right now uh concerning manipal itself if you have any exposure to that uh, what are some good ways uh, one could start i mean you mentioned simulations but then uh, after a while you just limited to the certain uh, gazebo words that are present or the ones that you can make and see uh, see you say you uh, talking about deep learning you could implement a model and then you can work on it what is uh, an equivalent uh, workbench kind of project one could take um simply with a laptop perhaps collaborate with uh, collaborate with friends okay wait so if i understood your question correctly like apart from doing normal like simulation stuff what else is there to do yeah i mean uh i mean you you talked about being a robotics researcher and that's that's a really broad that's a really broad term uh, right now so are there professors we could work under or oh, so okay 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 those projects that are going on like that because if you okay. consider deep learning there there's the tensor flow there are open project open source projects under tensor flow so stuff like that if you're aware of any okay so uh, since you mentioned professors i can recommend the entire mechatronics department to you uh, because actually we have uh, if 
we have i keep well, I mean, it's mechatronics so we have professors working on all uh, aspects we have one working on uh, medical imaging uh, one working on fuzzy control for manipulators uh, one working on like what i'm working on right now uh, mathematical modeling of spatial mechanisms and one working on actual like industrial stuff uh, cnc um, modeling and all so uh, if you are like talking about um, money pal uh yeah i think uh, is this is a problem i i think i've noticed that manipal is no one really works on like robotics robotics everyone's either ai 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 cv 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 or what was the other one nlp uh, and the others are like you've got the 1960 boomer type people who are working on material science and cnc yeah, yeah, and stuff yeah. so robotics is kind of new but I mean, even if you're like uh, if you want to kind of work on offline projects like apart from simulation stuff best thing i would do is publicize what you're doing and actively call for like funding like say linkedin linkedin is a very good place to network with professionals if you know and so what you can just do is say that okay this is what i've worked on so far i'm at a simulation stage i want uh, funding to or like support from other academics to work under them so that i can make this project uh, bring this project to life and people actually do come forward uh, i was uh, approached by this uh, singaporean startup to work with them on um, uh, de- designing agvs for their warehouses in bengaluru so oh, yeah. like that's one thing that you can uh, do like openly announce that you're working on this and uh, there's also one aspect that you can um, cold email various professors on university say that hey this is my idea i mean this is who i am what i'm working on are you interested in like taking me as a research intern to work on my idea stuff like that ah uh, cool cool i asked that because there's there's heck a lot of individualism around manipal like nobody is very open about what they're working on and they don't really they don't collaborate uh, they won't come up with the better ideas so yeah but yeah that sounds like a plan thanks Uh, yeah and um, uh, there's also like if you have a proper idea and like it's done with a professor like you are working with a professor the sort i came to know from achintya like you can actually approach mahe for funding and all but it, it is a long process but yeah you can actually approach mahe for funding and all if you tell them ki okay i'm going to have these many research pr- uh, papers at the end of the project or something like that So yeah, that's another thing that I know. And uh, any other questions? Um, I think someone else also wanted to ask something. And okay, Aman is asking recommended college teachers working in the field from Manipal. Like okay, so specific professors you, uh, Achha, you like robotics field wise. Yeah, uh, yeah. Any specific professors that you would. Uh, oh okay, yeah. Another so, thing. Uh, sorry. Uh, another thing is, uh, 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 IC is a good place to look in, like the innovation center. Uh, honestly, the projects that I work on are uh, from like Harish sir. I've already mentioned in previously, uh, and. Uh, i see tends to get really you know projects from really uh, big companies you know uh, and uh, in general also they are supportive of new projects like i had heard some uh, guy was working on a project on like you know uh, like sensors or something it was very interesting like related to biology and sensors something of that sort so i see is one place you can look for uh, i'm sure there must be robotic related projects as well so yeah sorry nihal continue okay so uh, from what i recall I, i actually it was difficult to find robotics professors apart from the mechatronics department because the only other i mean when you're talking about the math stuff uh, one professor i could uh, recommend is uh, ankur jaiswal he is from mechatronics department again uh, he is like i mentioned he is the one working on uh, spatial mechanisms uh, modeling of spatial mechanisms there is a uh, chetri mayun lochan also from mechatronics she is the one working on uh, fuzzy control of robotic manipulators so like electronics and uh, there are 
if you're interested in like the iot portion of robotics you have um asha cs and uh, dadi ravi kant or uh, both are from megatronics they work in the iot field uh imaging you have uh, munendra singh he works on uh, medical imaging apart from this uh, if uh, actually apart from this i wasn't able to find any like robotics robotics oriented professors you can however a, i mean uh, yeah you can approach i think cs department for professors for cv or ros related stuff and actually even uh, the megatronics department did get uh, a set of cobots in the lab so we already have one big industrial um in our robotics lab right now and this year we also got uh, one uh, ur5 uh, universal robot cobot thing so so that we can work on uh, uh, like ros related stuff so i think your best bet if you want to directly work on robotics is approach the megatronics department so because uh, i mean uh, yeah there are all almost all the faculty there are working on some field directly related to like mechatronics in general and robotics in particular okay um any more question guys you can either put it or uh, like put it on the questions channel or you can uh, unmute and ask it yourself um okay no more questions then i'm um, i'm assuming there are no more questions so yeah we can bring the session to a wrap thanks a lot nihal for you know spare, taking some time out and preparing this wonderful pe- presentation and talk yeah. for us and uh, yeah those who are uh, new to this channel you can uh, uh, new to this server you can check out in the main channel and fill the form if you want to join rsm and um, yeah i guess that's it if you are interested in uh, i am very i am pretty active in the robotics channel on the discord server so if you are interested uh, in like learning stuff i can guide you so once you join the discord server yeah thanks nihal <laughs> for doing the plug in for us and uh, yeah i guess then uh, that's it for now thanks uh, nihal and uh, if you guys are interested we can arrange more sessions on robotics and hopefully bring on uh, alumni as well so yeah i think we are done okay guys chalo bye okay bye bye